Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm John Strickland, uh, talking to you live from London. Welcome to, mm. I would say, this year's virtual ATM. It is, in fact, the only virtual ATM we've had so far, and hopefully it will be the only one, because, of course, we should have had the Arabian travel market a few weeks ago down in Dubai. Uh, I'm delighted uh, that we've got uh, uh, the president of Emirates, Sir Tim Clark, as our guest to open up the next three days of uh, online events. And there will be a chance uh, during the next hour for you to put your questions forward to Sir Tim. I'll try to pick one or two as we go along. I've got a big list of my own, and hopefully we're going to cover a lot of topics for you. you'll all be interested in. So, first of all, let's welcome Sir Tim Clark. Tim, a good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. You've been stuck in Dubai, I think, from the middle of March, you are just telling me. I have indeed, yes. Um, uh, the the airline is currently in a, in a in suspense, the best you can put it that way, although we have a lot of our aircraft being uh, deployed as freighters. But basically the passenger operation has stopped since the 25th of March. Now, we, the, the airline is coming up to 35 years uh, of age uh, this year. You have guided the airline right since the beginning, and I, I, I would say very much uh, it's been your vision to see what Dubai could do and develop the airline. But uh, we've seen crises in our times, but we've perhaps uh, never seen one quite like this, have we, Tim? No, I, 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 I don't think in my career I have seen, as you say, anything like this. And if you were to aggregate all the crises that we've faced in the last 30 or 40 years, I don't think some of those would be equal to what has happened here. Um, and it is, it is a, a huge structural uh, change to, the, to our industry. But, uh, in the, but in general terms, I think what we're seeing or have seen is a kind of $15 trillion torpedo hit the global economy and it's crippled many, many sectors of it. Um, and uh, transportation, leisure are just a few of the casualties at the moment. And uh, it began to emerge, of course, at the beginning of the year, your financial year for 1920 finished to end of March. And it, up until the arrival of this virus, it had been a good year, hadn't it? You'd actually seen an improved profitability year on year. Uh, 32 years out of 35 of uh, Emirates' years of existence have been profitable. And then it sort of started to go pear shape. But uh, you, you've seen load factors up, uh, revenues uh, per, per passenger growing, even though you'd had Dubai Airport closed for or part of one of the runways at Dubai Airport closed for a period of that time. Yeah, that's absolutely right. We Up until, um, I would say, the middle of February, things were really going well, although we had started to see the beginnings of the demand destruction as a result of uh, the virus starting to take uh, hold in, in Asia and then migrating into Europe. But nevertheless, we had uh, strengthened our cash position. As you say, our profitability was well ahead of the previous year, the year before that. Um, the balance sheet was very strong. Uh, we had been taking new aircraft, opening new routes. Mexico was one of those. And as you rightly said, we had a 45-day shutdown in, in uh, May of last year and uh, in half of June, which we managed to, to get through and keep, keep going. So it um, had all the makings of a great year until this thing happened. So uh, we've been – but we still managed to close the year with a profit. We still managed to close the year with uh, – good cash on the balance sheet and uh we were we were ne we were quite pleased with what actually happened in the end but then of course we we're right into march and then the everything came to a grinding halt a full hard stop and i think the, the interesting thing if interesting is the right word about this particular crisis is it it's not bound in the normal way we would expect a, a crisis to be I, I know many people have said does it compare to 9-11? Does it compare to a financial crisis or the volcanic ash cloud? But all of those either seem to have a geographic limit or an understandable uh, man-made economic element. But this, of course, is, as far as I can recall, the first kind of global event yeah. of this type that's ha having both a human and an economic effect. Absolutely. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I don't think anybody would uh, disagree with that, John. Um, and as I said, we are, as an industry, we are not alone in the effects of all of this. So, as I said earlier, this has crippled the, the global economy in just about every single facet of, uh, of the way the, uh, the, the global economy has been working over the last 20, 30 years. Um, so, you know, we, we are, are we're, we're faced with, as I said, big structural problems in the airline industry, changes afoot. Um, my own belief is that 
there is sufficient resilience in the global economy to take this trauma um, as long as it doesn't go on for too long. And I think uh, if we can if we can accept that there is a finite point where we will see the back of this and the adjustments to the way we go about our lives, the way we go about our businesses, and important the way we go about our travel aspirations, um, we will see things moving back back to some kind of normality uh, during the course of 21. I'm not optim overly optimistic about what is going to happen in the meantime. We're just going to tough it out, I'm afraid. Well, in the immediate, I think uh, you stopped flying completely, wasn't it? At the end of March, 23rd of March, uh, everything had to stop. But there's been a kind of a strange, uh, not exactly a renaissance or a morphing of your activity. Of course, you already have a strong cargo operation, both in terms of dedicated freighters and belly hole. But you were telling me just before we came on, uh, you've got an enormous proportion of your fleet, at least on the 777 fleet, but is now working on cargo flights too. Yes, we, um, being the opportunists that we are, we could see by the late March that with the uh, shrinking of, of global capacity, particularly in the, uh, the belly hole capacity, and the shortage of freighters or freighters that there was an opportunity and because we had the 777-300ER which is a, a hugely capable aircraft over medium long haul operations um, and because we had uh, actually opted for the large cargo door at the uh, rear of the aircraft we were able to put 14 pallets into the uh, uh, into the hole below decks and then we've also activated seats we've taken seats out we're filling the hat racks up etc but as demand, of course, as we all know, for PPE, for pharmaceuticals, rocketed. Um, there was a, an acute shortage of supply. So we were able to move very quickly and we converted ourselves into a mini UPS, as one of my head of planning has told me. Um, and we, so today we have 85 of those ERs flying and 11 freighters on top of that. So 96 of the 153 that we've got in the 777 fleet are operating well. Now that's not going to deal with the loss of passenger income but it certainly keeps the wolf from the cash door which is the uh, the, the, the real bugbear of the airline industry at the moment so uh, we're trying to mitigating the the effects of having the whole a380 fleet on the ground at the moment which is 115 aircraft uh, with all the crews in place etc so um, it's not been easy but we've done the best we can to to op optimize whatever opportunity we get on that freight side of it. and it's it, there doesn't seem to be any signs of it going away at the moment or diminishing. Um, so long may it last. That's at least uh, one uh, uh, bright spark in this whole uh, rather sorry situation. Mm -hmm. We are, of course, hearing from many airlines around the world that the, the, the grief is just major and uh, not only are our fleets grounded, but uh, many airlines are talking about aircraft not coming back. We're hearing about uh, inevitable impact on employment in the sector. And in fact, you did announce yesterday that uh, there will be some job losses uh, in Emirates. Uh, do you know more about that at this stage, Tim, or how that will actually be handled? Well, we've, um, I'm not saying we've bided our time. We mm -hmm. have been we've been so involved in getting this freighter operation going we we were kind of hoping uh that things might start easing up a little bit and we had targeted the uh second half of may believing things would start moving well clearly they haven't and uh and in our in with our business model the access to the country the markets that we face this hasn't hasn't materialized yet so it was quite clear that a continuation given that we had some income coming from freighters, wasn't sufficient to meet the, the, the cost. So we've, we've had to uh, consider what the sizing of the airline is going to be about that. That's it. <laughs> I, was to, I was trying to improvise. Now I know what it is to be, I don't know, a, a, a stand-up in, in a club when you, when you haven't got yes. this material. Winging. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, we, we oh. uh, seem to be in a problem on our end. Okay, good. Well, that's, that's good to hear. I'm glad it's not from my, my global headquarters, i.e. the back bedroom uh, here in North London. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tim, I think we were just getting yeah. into it. You were talking about, sadly, having to um, uh, lose uh, yeah. some jobs. You were talking about that one. Yeah, I'm afraid, afraid uh, as I said earlier, that's uh, uh, one of the, uh, the casualties of, of uh, the operation at the moment. Hello? Yeah, I'm still here, Tim. So I just uh, put my video off for a second. Yeah, anyway, so 
uh, in a nutshell, we this is this is uh, steps we're going to have to take. We we just can't keep uh, our our employees doing nothing for so long. Um, so we're going to have to let some of them go. Unfortunately. Yeah, unfortunately, it's uh, the nature of the industry right now. I'm certainly getting a lot of people getting in touch with me, uh, especially young people who are studying like aviation degrees, pilots, wondering about their future careers. So there's not really a lot you can say except to you know do your level best to be resilient. You know, there will be a, a future industry. It's just uh, we have to learn from this uh, amazing set of events. Now, of course. The particular challenge is to getting people flying again, aren't there, Tim? I mean, practical things like bo the borders all closed in a, a not only a mm -hmm. rapid but a very dislocated way. I guess yes. if they're going to open, we, there's not much hope of seeing a nice global, calm, uh, organised reopening. And of course, the issue of quarantine, where some countries uh, apply quarantine and others don't. You were telling me before, the call device who has a 14-day quarantine and no um, a non. Emirati nationals can uh, travel other than expats who live there. We have the 40-day quarantine due to come in here next week in the UK. Uh, it really is difficult to, to do anything else in terms of starting to restore business with those kind of barriers in place, isn't it? Absolutely. I think the, the, uh, the advantage will be for those countries that have a lot of domestic operation, um, the, the United States, of course, Europe. So you'll see start, uh, uh, RPK starting to grow fairly rapidly over the course of the summer in those areas. You might see some in the, in the Far East as well. Um, so that the, uh, there will be the beginnings of, of uh, uh, production movement in those areas. So the uh, advantage will be taken by then. For the, for the uh, other airlines who are in the medium to long haul category, it's uh, obviously going to be more difficult. The, the country access conditionality uh, the protocols on on uh, the onboard protocols are all the uh, large unknowns at the moment. So it makes planning for a resumption start uh, quite complicated. Needless to say, we have a 24-7 watch on it as countries uh, start to relax um, their uh, access requirements. But uh, I see some difficulties in that time, and I don't believe that they will open at the pace that we would like. I think there will be a degree of um, what they, they started to call the bubble effect, i.e. countries selecting other countries mm -hmm. and they uh, relatively COVID-free, and therefore they will allow services between those countries. So this is we're, we're seeing the beginning of this. Um, and, uh, yeah, until we get much more clarity on the kind of uh, conditions that you mentioned, quarantine, flight protocols, how the airports are going to go about handling these passengers when they eventually get moving. Uh, we, we still, we're still on in early days and we're trying to uh, understand what's going to happen here. And, and I think uh, the other challenge of you know, building customer confidence is important too, isn't it? Uh, uh, there could be psychological concern in different groups of customers. Maybe elderly people are worried about uh, their risk of exposure, families and so on. And uh, this whole discussion about on aircraft, whether we should have a middle seat free, without, without debating that now, because obviously that, that is just economically, uh, it's, it's, it's lunacy. And it, it's, doesn't work for any airline and doesn't doesn't solve the problem but on the ground as you said at, at airports uh, my uh, my kind of worry is that if we have to keep these protocols of distancing in place how, how on earth can we ever come back to a, a good volume of flying unless we get a vaccine uh, hopefully sooner than later because of the airport capacity is cut dramatically. I think I heard Dublin the other day saying their capacity would be down 70% if, if these distancing uh, methods have to be put in. I guess Dubai is going to be a similar high multiple too. Yeah, you're absolutely right. The, um, the, the, to your point about the vaccine, the various strands of work that are going on at the moment, mm -hmm. the, the ultimate solution being the vaccine or and or uh, antiviral therapeutic medicines, which in combination with a vaccine, even if the vaccine doesn't have 100% efficacy, uh, it's still better than nothing at all. And if we can develop the uh, antiviral medicines at the same time, we've got a fighting chance of getting some uh, normality on the, on, in, in, on, in the global economy. At the same time, uh, this whole question about how we go about dealing with the pandemic and the presence of the virus until the vaccine comes comes along leads us into all the social distancing requirements 
uh, the uh, onboard protocols, airports, but it's not just in the in the airline business. You can go from theatres to railways, exactly. to all sorts of other. It, it pans across. Now, in the airline world and the airport world, we have a job to do with regard to trying to explain that um, in the time that this has happened, I can taking Dubai as an example, they have uh, been around the terminals with um, meticulous detail in disinfecting and cleaning and taking the opportunity to to do all of that on multiple uh, occasions. Paul Griffith's uh, team, as he's running the airport, have been they make, making out sure that these are very clean spaces for people to transit through or even eventually when we start flying passengers back into Dubai and departing them. Equally on board the aeroplane, we've introduced a number of protocols which um, we believe if they are well promulgated amongst the uh, consumers that we regularly travel, travel, uh, travel on us, uh, they'll see that we have introduced large um, measures in trying to uh, implement in-flight hygiene, which is not just a one-off. It's a constant attention to the hygiene requirements on board the aeroplane as people fly. And we're also giving them the, the, their own tools to uh, look after the spaces that they sit in, which is basically uh, we give them masks, we give them gloves, we give them sanitizers, we give them uh, things which they can they can clean their own seats if they want to. They can clean the um, the, the seatback screen if they want to. So there's 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 a degree of personal control. And as you know, on our three eighties, we always had what we call cabin service attendants who uh -huh. weren't. Actually cabin crew, but they were the basically the janitors on board because on the 380 we had 17 toilets. Well, we moved those onto the 777 and their job is to, is to uh, 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 sterilize and clean the toilets on board every 30 minutes at a minimum. And uh, if there's high usage to go in and interdict the, the sort of flow of passengers into the toilets and clean up, constantly sterilizing. So we've got a lot of things going on. The crew, of course, are clad in PPE, they're, um, they are gloved, they are masked, uh, and they can still go about their work quite easily. So when other airlines do this, and I'm sure they already are, the notion that you would, uh, and of course, don't forget, we've got incredibly potent filtration, air filtration systems on these aircraft. Um, the, the air on a uh, 380, both decks, is changed every two minutes, and a similar uh, sort of change out on the 777. Fresh air, of course, as you know, is introduced. Uh, the air is recycled through very, very, very uh, resilient, potent filters where you get 98, 99% of anything, including the virus, will be filtered out. So actually, the air on board the aircraft is actually in a very hygienic state, and, and, it, and it's a sustained one. It's not just a one-off process. So we've, uh, the, the whole business has got work to do. Now, if we start leaving seats in the economy inventory open or unsold because of social distance, distancing, uh, one has to uh, accept that the, you have to be consistent about this. It's no point just leaving the seat next to you empty because the seat behind you, yeah, exactly. somebody sneezes or coughs, even, irrespective of the seat back meant to be deflecting it, it won't actually happen. As you know, mm -hmm. the seat these will travel 20 feet down the cabin or in an enclosed space. So what, what it basically means is that you will have to take 50% of your, in, in the case of economy, uh, economy inventory out. Now, with the continuous change going on the mass, the calculus, uh, it doesn't stack up um, for anybody to do that. Uh, you know, the airline business models, whether they are low cost or long haul, etc., uh, require high volumes, low margins, unfortunately. And through that, we have become hugely efficient as an industry over the last 20 or 30 years. Um, if you then start interdicting the basis of that business model, then the, the maths start to become adverse and it becomes more difficult to. And, and equally, on the environmental side, it makes absolutely no sense yeah. to apply empty aircraft or half empty aircraft because, you know, we're all very, very conscious of this. So I'm hoping that eventually there will be, given what we are doing on the airplanes, given the things I've said, given that we will ask passengers to wear masks and gloves, that hopefully, and, and that'll become a kind of a paradigm shift, not just in the airline and airport world, but in everywhere else, until we're free of this virus and the vaccine comes in and therapeutics that I talked about earlier. Um, so I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not that optimistic. I think we will find a way where mankind can adapt 
very quick and move on. So, you know, it's just early days and everybody's trying to feel their way. This is uh -huh. not something we've been subjected to at all in our lifetimes. Um, and, and we've just got to make those adjustments. But as I said earlier, we have resilience in the global economy. We have resilience in, in the aspirations of, of uh, the population of the planet, one way or the other. So eventually we'll get over this. It's just probably the next six to nine months where it's going to be tough. Well, Tim, I, I've been told metaphorically in my ear by the technicians, we, we can't continue, uh, although you and I uh, have the, 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 the time, we can't continue beyond the planned session. So uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to cut to some nitty gritty that I really want to ask you about and I think okay. you'll be uh, happy to talk about and see if you and I can maybe do a recording separately uh, where we can cover some of the other uh, uh, interesting elements that we won't have time for now. So when I say the nitty gritty, of course, you are yourself a network planner at heart, a route planner. That is my background. You can imagine I had questions on my list to ask you about that. So in this unknown world that we, we are experiencing, you know, of course, I've been asking myself, not just for the purpose of this interview, Emirates, any airline, how on earth uh, can you plan a network ahead, both in terms of capacity and mix of traffic, when none of us has the faintest clue what is actually out there? And I'm thinking em Emirates, of course, in particular, everybody's asking about the A380. It's been a, a great success for you in a way that other allies have not managed to achieve. You've, you've had the scale. It's been a success in terms of meeting the needs of a Dubai hub and giving yeah. it amazing customer satisfaction. And I know you said you expect, at least in your planning scenario, most of them will come back. Of course, we've already talked about some aspects of a 777 as a great workhorse. And, of course, you have orders of a pipeline for not necessarily completely beyond the A380. It was meant to overlap. But the next-gen aircraft, the 350, the 787, and the 7779, how are you managing with your colleagues in, in, in the network side right now to work through scenarios about the kind of mix? And can you indeed use your fleet as it is today uh, to any extent as it has been until now? Well, John, that, that, that's the $64,000 question that all airline planners are facing at the moment. It is, this is the great unknown unknown. We just don't know what is going to happen. When in doubt, follow your instinct. That's what I've always done. My instinct is telling me that by the summer of next year, and I, 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 I go back to the, the two strands of work going on at the moment, the vaccine strand and the, the uh, social distancing side of things, and my bet is falling onto the vaccine strand. Okay, and I believe that that, as I said, irrespective of the fact that you might not get 100% efficacy, you'll get a vaccine that does the job to a large extent, plus all the other bits and pieces. If we can get a massive global inoculation program going by the uh, first quarter of next year, and and you know there's work afoot with the pharmaceuticals, with the greatest minds uh, in medical research, life sciences, pharmaceuticals, whatever. Um, I think we have a fighting chance of getting it, and my bet is on that. So that I believe once we have got everybody through the inoculation process, a bit like we did with polio, with smallpox, and everything else, we will start th seeing things come back to normal. And that way, I would think by the summer of next year, we will start to see an uptick, quite a large uptick in, in demand for travel. Uh, both on the short haul and for airlines like ourselves. And we are, we are very well placed with our business model and our network reach to do just that very quickly. We can activate this fleet probably within 48 hours if we have to. Um, so we are, we are always in a state of readiness and I believe that that is likely to happen. Going forward into 23, 24, demand will continue to come back unless there is some other major trauma to the global economy. So I think probably by the, by the year 22, 23, 23, 24, we'll see things coming back to some degree of normality and Emirates will be uh, operating its network as it was and hopefully successfully as it was. But you've got to believe, you, you, you've got to, you, you basically got to make a stand and say, in the end, this is what we're going to work towards. Otherwise, you're, you're, you're looking mm -hmm. into a, a big black hole. And when you've got uh, $50 billion worth of assets which are not being employed gainfully, that's nowhere to go. You've got to come up with some kind of solution, map your cash flows, um, and hope for the best and, and plan towards that in the hope that it does come back. But I do feel, I do feel that once we're through this year calendar and we've got through all the things we've talked about, um, that demand will 
you know, I'm not saying that, that people have got short memories, mm -hmm. but they are anxious to get on with their lives. They're anxious to enjoy their lives, and they all have aspirations. They may be conditioned by difficulties of furloughs, not having enough money in, in, you know, from salaries, etc. That's going to uh, dampen demand in the short term. But after that, once we're into the uh, into well into 21, then I think things will change. Well, I guess you you'll have to you know play all the. Uh permutation games on traffic flows as you've done before but in a bigger scale you've moved 380s around on and off routes according to fluctuations in demand in different parts of the world and your network's very well balanced globally but i guess you'll you have to do that on a bigger scale and also the, the premium capacity we think about those um, beautiful uh, business class cabins both on the 787 7 so the triple seven and the 380 i guess it will be some pain good for the passengers but you know, tougher for ever so, some pain in terms of having to be more creative on pricing to fill those seats term in, in the short term medium term yeah i, I think these are short-term issues john mm -hmm. I, I i think that the emirates uh, value for money proposition in all its cabins has always been a good one uh we have been able to 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 manage our uh, trip economics and our pricing points in all cabins uh, very well i don't see really why it change um and uh, the, the quality of the products that we offer, we don't see being diminished at all as we go forward into, into the, the new era. Yes, there may be a diminished demand. People tend to think that the corporate segments, business segments are going to diminish significantly. I'm not of that view, notwithstanding the fact that we've all become very adept at these kind of uh, video con conferencing platforms. And, uh, and I've always thought and I've always said in the last three to five years that the the office would be, the physical office would be an anachronism in the second part of this uh, century. Mm -hmm. and that people would be working at home far more effectively. Uh, and, it, you know, when you see the beginnings of the four-day week coming into play, um, where people, where productivity rises because you're no longer having to travel to the workspace and lose all that time, people can actually get more done. Uh, it's it's a possibility that you might get the the three day weekend or something like that, which which allows people to um, uh, travel for leisure if they want to. And they can still co stay connected when they're there. So I I'm not sure that we will see a diminishing of the corporate segments and even the leisure segments, all the segments we carry over time. At the moment, yes, uh, there is no contest that there are going to be difficulties. But going forward, no, I I do believe that we'll get it back. Um, and uh, uh, aircraft like the 380 will come back into its own again in a year or two. And with the, the fleet that is coming through, I mean, we're talking about a few years down the line with the 350s, the 787s, and the 779. I do remember one of the last times we were talking that you'd done a, a root and branch review of the network, and there would have to be a new, new approach to the structure of the network and the use of Dubai Airport with those aircraft coming through because they are. Uh, in unit terms, are smaller. Do you think there might be any likelihood that any of those deliveries would be advanced and there could be a kind of a new blend in the transition uh, between the current fleet of uh, 380s, 777s and the new mix? Yeah, the, ordinarily, that would probably have been the case. As we know, the 380, um, they, they stop producing next year, so they will be, we will continue to use our fleet as, as meaningfully as we can. Um, and yes, the 350 and the 787 were, were uh, great uh, aeroplanes, are great aeroplanes to do what we need for the network going into the next uh, five or ten years. The reality of the situation today is like all airlines, all bets are off. Everybody in this business, all airlines, are facing critical cash flow issues. And this isn't about mapping what you like to have. This is, a bit, uh, this is about surviving the, the present. And you can see it right the way across the uh, airline world. Um, and it, the reality is that the part of the mix of the assessment going forward is what is your fleet like to be? What is the affordability of new aeroplanes? What is the affordability of existing aeroplanes, etc.? This is for you and me, for planners. We, 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 we've never been there before. We've never been into this rather horrendous situation the airline industry finds itself in. So you're having to rethink exactly what your priorities are. One is survival, of course. And for most of them, as they are, they are 
being underpinned by state, some of those great private enterprises who never had any subsidies, of course, are now receiving large amounts. Um, and now that is a realization by the, the government, the public sector, that they, do, they will not survive unless they are bailed out, so to speak. Um, when that tranche of money runs out, is anybody's guess. If you do not get this industry operating very quickly, all the money that's gone into those companies is absorbing the obligations, cash obligations they have at the time, maybe fleet, staff, etc., etc. But it presupposes that you will be starting to fly meaningfully and profitably, generating positive cash flow in the next few months. Unfortunately, I don't see it to the scale that these companies need to to meet their cash obligations. So we're nowhere near out of the woods. So when you back that into fleet orders or new aircraft acquisition, the planners of the company, the management of all these companies are looking at one thing, that survival and, and keeping the cash where it needs to be, uh, short of going out of business. So I think the aerospace manufacturers, um, they're alive to this, they're aware of this, and they're already seeing signs uh, as aircraft, uh, 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 future orders are, are pushed out or even cancelled. Um, unfortunately, until we can get income coming back into this business to the level that it was prior to COVID-19, it's anybody's guess as to how each individual carrier is going to manage the short, medium and long term. But I would suggest that we are nowhere near uh, confident enough that the, the economics the cash flows, the bottom line, are going to be put us in good, uh, a good position uh, to be able to say, yes, we'll buy 100 of this, 100 of that, etc., etc. I'm, I'm not optimistic there, but again, it's short term, short to medium term. Will it come good again in 23, 24? Probably. Uh, but I don't think it's going to happen before then. Well, it's definitely going to be very interesting when we see, uh, you know, Boeing and Airbus come out of it typical annual market forecast for the next few months. I know I spoke to Boeing. I know Boeing is uh, probably going to run theirs a bit later, not surprisingly, while they work out how on earth they, they come up for 20-year forecast. But as you said, I think the mix of aircraft is going to be interesting because on the one hand, there maybe there's opportunities for manufacturers if older aircraft go, but short term, as you said, the capital needs mean that some of those older aircraft against logic, especially maybe 747s with an airline like BA might stay a bit longer because at least well, they're paid for. These, these are the easy ones. That's the low-hanging fruit in fleet. Mm -hmm. Aircraft that have gone through their maturity process, they've fully written down, they're ancient, etc. That's A lot of the current fleet today is on debt, whether it be through operating leases, through financial leases, all sorts of debt structures. To the notion that you would simply ground them and say that's okay, well, it's not because you have contractual obligations to the entity that is either providing the debt or the operating lessons or whatever it may be. And this is the real problem, that the fixed costs and the debt that's incurred to support the, the, the fixed costs is, is something that will not go away. And um, so the, the trick is to get them flying and get them generating the income as quickly as possible. The longer it is left, the more difficult it is for the airlines to go past or get back to that inflection point, which we're not quite at at the moment, but there will be an inflection point where we will get to the point of no return if we're not careful. So we must get this business back on its feet as quickly as possible. And it's important that governments um, understand, uh, I'm quite sure that they're all aware of the other uh, imperatives in other sectors of their economy, but this business is in a critical and very fragile state at the moment, and it needs all the help it can get. Access, getting the, 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 the airlines moving again, getting passengers and freight moving again, not necessarily to the levels that they were pre-COVID, but at least get something going mm -hmm. to give the cash lifelines that they need. Otherwise, I'm not optimistic. For some of the carriers that are here today that already have been significantly bailed out, we'll, we'll get through the next few months. Well, it's interesting that I was just, uh, in my efforts to fit, fill in, so to speak, while we we're sorting out the technical problems, talking about some of the European groups, where Air France, KLM and Lufthansa, for example, IAG, with all very different approaches, the eternal Phoenix scenario of Alitalia. Uh, government money is going in in different ways to some of these groups, not uh, IAG. 
that, yeah, it's interesting. Air France, for example, they're still talking about cutting. Uh, you know, ben Smith, the CEO there, is talking about cutting the domestic network massively because of losses it makes. Lufthansa was already in that path of uh, cutting. They say they'll come back smaller, probably big questions about their European group. So as you said, there could still be yet more capacity coming out there. I'm wondering if in the UAE whether we might see uh, a kind of further move to consolidation there. You've already got a very close partnership with Fly Dubai. Um, do you think this might expedite working even more closely together? Because that's been pretty successful for both airlines so far. And you've also talked before about, uh, there's always that, question from a media about Etihad, Will Emirates and Etihad merge. You've talked about synergies behind the scenes and Etihad has of course been shrinking. I think I know the answer you'll give on, on that one about who will decide it, but you have some thoughts on both those aspects too. Well on the on the fly Dubai side of things, irrespective of COVID nineteen, the plan was to uh, merge uh, not merge the carriers, but but to to extract root synergies um, and uh, scale economics out of both carriers working far, far closer together than they had before. That was, that was an ongoing process and we were building that relationship until we got the, the hard stop. As soon as we uh, get through this, that uh, bridging, that building will continue. Um, and it has this, this uh, last couple of months, we've been able, the plan has been able to set back a little bit and make an assessment of perhaps where this um, relationship can be activated a little bit more meaningfully, more profitably, and giving both carriers the synergies that are going. So that's going to continue to, to, to uh, happen, and I think the two airlines will continue to grow together. As far as Etihad is concerned, yes, we, we uh, continue to have a very good working relationship with them. Uh, we remain separate brands, separate entities, and as long as we don't stray into the, uh, the competition area where we, where we really don't want to breach any rules, where we can work together, we do. Um, but Tony Douglas has been primarily concerned himself with downsizing the airline to get into a better uh, size and shape for what the, the, his shareholders require. I think their main thrust has been trying to get it into that kind of shape. Once he's there, and of course this was all before the hard stop, um, once he gets it where he wants it to be, then I'm quite sure that the two airlines will talk again about where they can they can uh, establish relationships for, for mutual benefit. And Tim, a little bit more broadly, and we're running almost out of time, uh, tourism, resilience, uh, Dubai in particular, and Emirates' role in that. Of course, the Expo 2020s had to be postponed, but Dubai, has, and indeed uh, with the partnership of Emirates, has made tourism a massive success, a massive part of the economy. Uh, do you think that will uh, be jump-started back into a vigorous life uh, sooner than later? Well, I think you, you've got a government who realises the, uh, the, the, the situation they're in with regard to the, this whole leisure sector, the aviation sector. And they're minded to open Dubai for business as quickly as possible. And I can say this, I, they, there's been an awful lot of work in this city in preparation for reopening, whether it's this mass sterilisation of the, the streets, the, the cleaning of everything. So the... the the city will be ready for international tourists and they can be assured that they, when they come here that all the protocols with regard to dealing with the pandemic and its fallout will be in place. Um, and, so, and, and because it is such a vital part of the GDP here, uh, they, no expense will be spared to get the city into good shape. Hopefully to bring tourists in, I'd like to think, uh, in July next month. Tim, I'm just um, going to jump in there very rudely. I'm sorry, they, they, they're telling me little messages where we're going to be cut off. We have to put another sixpence in a meter. So you and I, subject to your diary, let's reconvene and we'll do a, a little re-record uh, and get a, cover a few of the other points we didn't have time to this morning. So, okay. so Tim Clark, thank you very much for now. Uh, of course, if I have a few seconds to say, you, you were due to disappear at the end of this month from Emirates and to take a, a leisurely retirement. I guess you're going to stick around a little bit longer. Well, I was, I was always going to do that, John. I was taking yes. on an Olympic role anyway. Um, and I've got a great team of people here. Great. Tim, thanks very much for now. We'll reconvene. And ladies and gentlemen, thanks for sticking with us. I think we managed to cover a, a decent uh, amount of topics, but there's always more with, with Tim. And I always like the chance to put those questions in here. Tim was a great answer. So thanks very much for everybody uh, for, for sticking around today. Tim, again, thanks again. We'll reconvene and uh, enjoy the rest of the virtual ATM. Thank you very much, everybody. 
is an extra bonus uh, conversation with Sir Tim Clark uh, to add to our live discussion earlier in the week. We had a couple of technical glitches, so uh, I'm very pleased to say Sir Tim has agreed to come back for a, an encore performance. And uh, we're recording this now, and it will go as an additional uh, piece of uh, content to, to go with the interview, which we did the other day. So Tim, welcome back to, to part two of our discussion for virtual ATM. I think when we were speaking on Monday, we were just talking a little bit about the, the aircraft manufacturers and uh, you know, the challenge of the marketplace now. I just wanted to add a couple of comments on that because I, I actually got some questions back myself. Uh, when you were talking about the uncertainty and about order books, uh, were you reflecting more on the wider market there or were you thinking about uh, Emirates position? Because obviously you've got a big order book and we're hearing from many airlines they're in discussion with manufacturers right now about deferrals or possibly cancellations. Yeah, I think I was uh, referring to the uh, wider market mm -hmm. uh, and the manufacturers, both airframe and propulsion and the whole supply chain into that. Uh, they are facing fairly bleak times as the airline industry is. If one is the airline industry, then they are going to have to uh, make the adjustments that clearly they are at the moment. And in terms of the, the survival of these massive uh, entities, Airbus and Boeing, I guess that's not in doubt, but it, it is going to be challenging for them. And maybe particularly, as you said, for some of the, uh, the supply chain uh, manufacturers themselves who produce some very specific components for, for aircraft, given the uncertainty that's going to be around us for uh, the coming uh, few years. Yes, I, I, I think that's, that's probably the case. These, these two particular entities are too large to fail. Um, they won't be allowed to fail. So let's be clear about that. But they will make all the adjustments along the lines that we've spoken about with regard to the order streams. But in the end, the uh, Airbus Consortium is a huge European uh, enterprise, as is Boeing for the, uh, for the uh, US, uh, for both civil and military. And so many, so many of the other critical supply chain manufacturers, and you think of pe people like General Electric, who are not just in civil aero engines, they're into a multiplicity of other products. All these are far too big to fail. So in the end, there will be a degree of support um, which will come from uh, multiple sources, but certainly that's what will happen. Uh, it is, a, it is a, a, a clear fact that airlines are looking at one, their orders per se, two, the uh, Delivery of aircraft, the stream of aircraft coming into them, they, they're obviously in a, in a pretty weak position. So all that's in play at the moment. I don't know how other carriers are doing it. Um, we have, a, as you, you alluded to, we have a, an order book which is pretty substantial. Um, and as part, part of our, our assessment of, of what life is likely to be in the next two or three years, um, depending on how that works out and how we think it will be basically will have a, have a bearing on what we do with the manufacturers. Um, and, and, uh, and hopefully there will be these, this will be done to, to mutual benefit. And I guess we, we, we talked already a little bit about the, the mix of aircraft shifting around and uh, generally speaking, we're moving to smaller, which is not to say tiny by any means, uh, aircraft. The, the biggest wide bodies in the future are going to be uh, the, the larger versions of the A350 and the 777. Nine, um, I, I, I guess it's anyone's guess as to the shape and size of the market for these aircraft right now. I mean, everybody accepts that uh, there is going to be the move down from the, the 380 and the 747, but uh, the scope of the big end of the market is probably perhaps the hardest to call, isn't it, Tim? Probably, although I probably mentioned the other day that much will depend on these two schools of thought with regard to whether we'll get the vaccine and global inoculation programs in place. And if you get that, this will all be behind us and we'll get back to business as usual. If, that, if we do go back to business as usual, notwithstanding some of the effects in the short term of, of primary segments, whether it be corporate, leisure, BFR, uh, whatever it may be, there, there will be a, an effect probably lasting maybe a year while those, things, those segments sort themselves out and come back to us. But eventually they will come back to us. And as far as I'm concerned, it would be folly to exclude large wide-bodied aircraft in the future. They have proven to be, particularly in the 384 Emirates, it has been a hugely successful aircraft. 
Um, and it's, especially when you've got fuel prices as they are today, if they were, for, if they were forever to stay at those levels, this aircraft is hugely potent. Uh, it's extremely popular. Its seat mile costs are very good, particularly with fuel at, at, at that level. And pr providing that demand holds up on the, on the first scenario, mass vaccination, I do not subscribe to this new norm. There will be differences and we will all be learning from those differences as a result of what has happened. But will this be a paradigm change in everything that goes on in the global economy? No, 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 it won't. The aspirations, the innovation, the uh, thirst for knowledge, information, ergo travel and experience will come back. If on the other hand, we do not find a vaccine and we are still trying to do contact uh, uh, trace contact and isolate whatever s systems and we're learning to live with uh, this virus, then of course that, that'll introduce a high level of conditionality in the demand and the drivers of demand for air travel. And we know what those are. I hope it's the former, not the latter. If it's the former, as I said, the 380 has a place. Now, where I've said it's, it's the end for the 380, this wasn't driven by Emirates, this was driven by the manufacturer deciding to stop production as Boeing did with the 747-400. That's not to say that the 777-9X and the A350-1000, which will be at the top end, won't be very good, very economical, very fuel efficient, environmentally friendly aircraft. But will they serve demand if it continued to grow at four or 5% per annum in global air tra travel uh, demand between the primary city pairs across the, uh, the Pacific or between Europe and Asia or the Middle East or whatever. Um, if you do a linear extrapolation of demand as perhaps it was on the basis of the first scenario, and then you size the unit according to the slot availability and the primary hubs that you're trying to connect, then the 380 and its 500 seats, even 600 seats comes back into its own. But what will happen is you'll be left with the 9X, which will be a 300 and 60, 65 seater in four classes if you've got premium economy and the 351,000, which will be not far behind that in terms of seat count. So actually, you are uh, uh, cutting back on the ability to accommodate what I think the demand will be. I'm not one of these people who believes that this is the end, this is it. What you see is what you get. No, 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 no. We've had all this. Admittedly, this is a really big one. Um, but I'm a great believer in the resilience of the global economy. I'm a great believer in the resilience, the change resilience of people post the, uh, the turn of this millennium. And I think um, once we, we're through this, then things will get back to some degree of normality. The jury's out as to how long that'll take, John. It, it, you know, uh -huh. some people, five years, some people, two years. Much will depend, vaccination, antiviral therapeutic medicines, which limit and contain the time you're actually afflicted with the disease. You perhaps may, may not end up in, in intensive care, even in hospital. Um, so taken together, there are, there, I believe there is a very strong chance of that happening. If that's the case, we've got to be optimistic. We've got to plan ahead. What we're doing is a lot of short-termism because we have to. How airports manage social distancing, how air, 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 airlines managing manage the nightmare of uh, social distancing on, on, and the effects on inventory and ergo price and why you fly half empty aircraft around and the environmentalists are saying this is complete stuff and nonsense makes no sense to me so it doesn't doesn't stack up well as you said tim i mean yeah you've got to look to look long term because then we look at the whole uh, 35 years of emirates if it wasn't a long-term vision back in 1985 we wouldn't be where we are today in terms of the scale and operation of Emirates. So uh, it's a, a very salient point. Just looking at the product around it, Tim, and we did touch on this, obviously you can't deliver all the, the product across all the cabins that Emirates is known for right now. We know the crew are going to have to wear PPE, they're going to be a, a sanitary uh, packs available for customers and so on. Uh, do you imagine you're going to evolve a kind of a compromise? Let, let's assume uh, in your optimistic scenario, there is a vaccine in perhaps uh, a year, 18 months. In the coming months, are you going to try to evolve a product so at least as many elements 
of it, which people uh, really enjoy, particularly the premium cabins at the standard bars and the, the lounges at, at the airports and the, uh, the quality of uh, food and uh, drink service on board. Uh, do you think it's going to be possible to evolve from delivering something relatively basic now, uh, but maybe has, doesn't actually reach uh, the normal level as yet? Well, I, I, we are adapting as we speak to, to whatever the requirements are. Yes, we have enormous numbers of protocols on the airplanes today, which to operate in a full cabin might be a little bit problematical. For instance, the crew get their own use of the toilets. We don't mix up the, the crew. We've got janitorial services in all the toilets. As you know, they're, they're cleaned and cycled very often. We've got the cabin crew, as you say, in, in PPE and visors, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we are trying to restore the level of uh, food offering to where it was, but not without the, you know, we're not offering a first class service at the moment. So, and much will depend, of course, on the requirements of the states, the countries that we fly to. And the jury is out on that at the moment. So, whereas we will, we will hold out that we are eminently hygienic and we are uh, almost a leader in many of the things that we're doing on top of the circulation of air and the filtration of viruses like COVID-19 through the filtration systems and everything else, um, you will then have to go through airports and airports will have to do something similar. In the end, I, I see no reason why we should not, of course, on the first school of thought, we should not restore our full product to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the, its former glory. There may be more efficient ways of delivering it, which we're looking at. There may be um, cost savings, of course, that come with all of that. But in the end, we, we need to maintain a, a uh, high level of product. That's what we're known for doing. Now, I don't know whether they, you know, the, the use of the onboard lounge at the back of the 380 on the upper deck will be allowed under in the short term by certain countries. We just don't know. But uh, I see no reason why um the the whole gamut of, of emirates product from a to z should not be back in the marketplace uh very quickly if we get the vaccination but it'll take a bit longer if we're going down the other path which i hope we don't go down. But no that we are not looking at cutting back any of that and evolving the products as well tim something you'd already got in the pipeline before this crisis hit and i'm interested to hear what you're thinking is now was premium economy. A few questions have come in from the audience about that. Uh, uh, somebody's asked, has Emirates revisited its premium economy plans in the light of COVID-19 and the pandemic's expected long-term economic impact? I mean, it's, we, we know it's been a, a useful tool. I know you and I have debated before the question of whether you get trade up from economy or downgrade from business. I mean, yeah. obviously, the, the market's going to change. Uh, and, and my own feeling is that is going to be quite a, a useful cabin for us to have. Uh, are you still carrying on that work? And indeed, with some of the fleet, well, a lot of the fleets on the ground, more than normal, would that allow you to maybe even expedite putting those cabins in still? And, and there is, all that is, very, in answer to the question, premium probably still is in the mix. Mm -hmm. Also, now, because people may be prepared to be, pay a little bit more and have a degree of isolation, a space, I should say, space which they wouldn't get in the economy. So yes, I think a lot of people will think that's a smarter way to do it. Um, and yes, the whole question of what we do with the fleet and what the new aircraft, yeah, we have aircraft on delivery, which have premium economy already there. Uh, one of the three agents is, is sitting in Toulouse, uh, waiting to go with the new premium economy in the forward cabin on the main deck, looking beautiful. So it's, it's still something that we would consider to be um, important to us. That's so good to know. And, and another question which we didn't uh, uh, manage to touch on so much in the session the other day uh, is a question of the environment. And I think, Tim, you were quoted in recent months saying that you were, uh, I can't remember what the phrase was, an environmental believer that Greta Thunberg had done her job as far as you were concerned. Uh, one of the things we're seeing in this whole crisis is the spotlight on aviation again and its uh, credentials, good, bad or otherwise, in terms of environmental issues. And in some governments being quite prescriptive about what airlines can do. Uh, France, for example, uh, been told where it can, maybe can fly in exchange for more funding. How do you see uh, the environmental side of things playing out? Uh, uh, is it going to be imposed by governments? Uh, is it upon the industry to show it's doing all it can? Well, I, in, 
take the last question first. Yes, the industry is doing an awful lot, but it doesn't mm-hmm. get the, uh, the the accreditation for all of the work that it is doing and, and has done and should and it should get. Um, yes, I can see the governments are taking the opportunity to uh, link bailouts to environmental demands, and they've never had that opportunity before. So hey, how they're likely to take it? Um, that that is that, that's slightly different from. Um, the the uh, 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 I say the core the championing of the cause of Greta Lundberg in trying to f- focus the attention on the need to deal with environment. I don't think there are many many people um, around today who don't believe in the messaging. The the way it's messaged is something else, but the messaging is very clear, and you can see responses to that not just in the aviation side of things. You can see where the French government may have to get involved in the auto, auto, uh, auto uh, 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 car production, etc., that they are linking that to production of um, electric cars. So automotive is in the crosshairs as much as the aviation side of things. Um, so I, 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 this, this, if this has been anything good out of it, it, it acts as a catalyst, an accelerant, to move into areas, and I do not believe that the environmental uh, change out that is required as we move away from fossil and hydrocarbons into all the other aspects, it's accelerating the research into all the other sustainable fuels, which was only a few years ago, base zero. People were playing around with it, but they weren't really developing it, and they weren't looking at the scalability of it. Now they are, and I think this has helped to do that. Now, as far as the airline world is concerned, we already have made huge inroads with, as you know, uh, propulsion, um, uh, uh, metallurgical applications, technology in the actual construction of materials that you use. The aircraft are lighter, they're more robust, they fly far more efficiently, they burn less fuel. Um, but the, that, that again, it still comes into the crosshairs of governments. It seems to be one of those things that uh, will never go away how, however hard we try. Um, but is that going to stop the growth of aviation? Is that going to stop uh, airlines buying aircraft? Is that going to stop people traveling by air? No, it's not. People may be a little bit more conditioned into the reasons that they do travel. They may think, well, is this really going to add value to what I do? Am I going to learn something? Am I going to enjoy something? Rather than a, a, a sort of a, a slightly frivolous approach to to uh, air travel, particularly in the low cost area, which by the way, has done a wonderful thing for mankind as far as I'm concerned. It's had its environmental impact, but it's been hugely beneficial because it's so efficient in what it offers at the price points that they offer. This is just fantastic. Something really, really good for uh, everybody who, who wants to, to travel short haul, even medium haul on these, on these uh, using these airlines that have those business models. So I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic that in many other areas other than civil aviation, there are going to be significant inroads made in the type of environmental uh, technologies that we employ in our general life lifestyles, whether it be all the sustainable applications into your house, power and utilities, um, as we said, automotive. Uh, and the, the, the footprints of production, the environmental footprints of production, all of these are behind the scenes, but are going on at a pace. So, and they don't really get called out or they don't really get recognized, but it is going on at a pace. Uh, uh, the corporate world is very conscious of the environmental demands, not out there in the, in the, in the media, but simply the way they deal with supply chains how they make demands on supply chains with regard to not only price and conditions, et cetera, but how environmentally friendly the production of the goods that they are using from the supply chain into theirs. And it's, it's across, across the corporate world now. And it doesn't really get mentioned, but it's there. And it's, it's, it's a very good story. We see it all the time in Emirates. You know, if we quote for anything or we ask people to quote for goods and services to us, particularly goods, they have to stack up on a green green uh, agenda and credentials with so to get into our into our supply chain. A lot going on, um, you know. An aircraft flies, as we all know, and it has to be 
flown at a certain speed um, and it has to have propulsion to do that. Now, I am not uh, optimistic about electric pr propulsion at this moment as we get a hydrogen-based fuel or something like that, which allows uh, electricity to power the engines. So you might eventually get rid of combustion in the, in the but even that I'm not optimistic about because you know, 380 needs a 72,000 pound thrust out of its engines, four, four engines on that. You need an awful lot of electrical power to be able to meet the, the, uh, the efficiencies that come with hydrocarbon. Um, Tim, uh, just uh, time again is working against us. A, a brief word on, on digital. Uh, I mean, I want to uh, uh, wrap up our, our talk today with a bit of a reflective moment. But on digital, I guess, I guess that is going to be expedited in its role in every aspect of what airlines do, be it uh, business processes, uh, the technology that's going to be required to overcome this COVID crisis or indeed any other challenge of a disease or virus in the future, as well as in terms of a customer interface? Yes, I, I again, we were well down that path already. I don't mm -hmm. think many airlines weren't on that path, uh, recognizing it. And yes, the, 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 the use of technology in the hands of people who perhaps didn't use it before, like we're doing at the moment, is going to be an accelerant to that. But the way we do our end-to-end -end processes, the way we do our in-house, the way we do our uh, relationships with the, through the distribution system, B2C, B2B or whatever, these are changing out at pace anyway. And, and well before COVID came along, uh, Emirates had large teams of people working on the change out from the old processes into the new digital era. So we were able to strip down resource, strip down staff, make the, 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 the processes so much more efficient so the people who were left in place could deal with so much more. So productivity has been rising all the time. That was pre-COVID. Um, is that going to stop because of COVID? No. Is it going to be accelerated? Possibly. But I'd like to think we were all already on a, on a, on a fairly uh, fast uh, crossover into the, into the digital applications. You know, and they change all the time. It's very difficult to keep your hands on, on what's going on and the way that technology is driving so much. But, um, you know, we like to think that we're battling away, trying to keep ahead of the, of, of the technology curve as it, as it comes out of the great, uh, great corporations, Microsoft, uh, Apple, whatever, and some of the uh, service providers um, on, on, the, on the web. But, uh, yeah, it's a good story. It'll, it'll continue to be part of our lives and it'll be continue to, to drive so much of what we do in the operational aspects of our aircraft, the way we engineer our aircraft, the way we fly our aircraft, and all the back of the house processes. And Tim, just to uh, conclude by looking, as I said, in a reflective way, we did have an interesting uh, question in uh, from one of the audience. Somebody said that they'd worked for Emirates for two decades and experienced firsthand the phenomenal growth in the 90s or 2000s and asked whether you agree that such growth is a one-off for any organization after which it levels off and follows norms, or can we expect other great inclines and regular groundbreaking initiatives? Ah, well, <laughs> That's a good question, isn't it? You know, it is a good question. And you know, history is full of areas of opportunity. Whether it was the industrial revolution, whether it was the uh, technologies such as we've just been talking about in the mid nineties, there were huge opportunities. There have been some significant changes the way mankind goes about its life and business over the last two or 300 years. And if you look at the major interdictions, you can see where opportunity always arises. So never say this is over. This is the only time, my goodness. There will be new business models, not just in the aviation business. There'll be new ways of, of uh, organizing yourself. And I talked the other day about the revolution that may come as a result of technology we talked about in the workplace. So when the Prime Minister of New Zealand says we're going on to a four day week, why did we think about it? And eventually you think about the universal income because technology allows your factories to be run and wealth creation for the, 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 the HR input being pretty low because the machines are doing it for you. What then do you do with the time? What business models can be created which then have a look at spare time, money on people's hands, and how are you going to, to deal with that? I, I, I think we are just at the beginning of this, this 
um, epoch almost, driven by technology. This is the, what they call the fourth revolution, just the revolution, I don't know where we are, the cow. But each time there is significant change, there is significant opportunity. So when you see change coming down, you know there will be people out there. My goodness, look at some of the small SMEs that started and now the greater good. Look at the likes of Apple. Look at Microsoft. Where were they 20, 30 years ago? Nowhere. When we came along in 1985, who exactly else was, was around? <laughs> and now look at them today. So if you were in 35 years, which of course, well, I certainly won't be around, there will be, people will look back and say, yes, Emirates was a, a product of opportunity and change. It took that opportunity and it became what it is. Um, and, and, you know, the notion that you would, you, you go into, you get to the, the scale economies and you start to flatten out, etc. People saying to us, uh, that to us in the 90s, then in 2000, then in the second decade, and now we're into the third decade, and we're still growing, not quite at the pace, because there's a finite limit to what you can do on planet Earth. There are so many cities you can connect, and etc. But at that point in time, we were being challenged all the time. When is it going to stop? How big can you get? Do you really know where you're going to go? Um, and uh, my own view was that we'll go as long as we can, and we will continue to do all the things that we're doing until there is a natural uh, slowing because we've just, just about done every city now. Um, in other walks of life, other businesses, the same kind of rules apply. Eventually, theoretically, there is a, 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 a maybe an end game. Others may not take the point. They may say, actually, I'm going to do this. You might, in our business, suddenly you get meaningful low cost, long haul. And suddenly you get airline X, which bases itself, I don't know, some geographically central country between the population masses and starts this huge operation of long haul low cost. And it grows and it grows because they do it right. They hit the spot with regard to what people want at the price point they're prepared to, and they just grow, providing, you know, aeropolitics doesn't in, interdict the ability to grow. So if you had a, a clean sheet of paper where people were, and companies were able to access countries without any restriction, and you had some of these aircraft, like the 350s or the 787s or whatever, um, able to operate, then there is another business model where you could see two or 300 long haul low cost aircraft with 400 seats, 450 seats on some of these flying with one stop to Australia or wherever it may be, offering a very good product. So, and with fuel as it is, there is an opportunity. So people might say, yeah, that's a good opportunity. I think we're going to have a go at that. The well, Tim, thing. it sounds it sounds like you are, uh, and, and know you, innately uh, optimistic. And I was just thinking as you were explaining that, uh, that when Emirates began, when you sat there with your metaphorical sheet of paper in the uh, early mid 80s, you were in your 30s. And I think back in my own uh, early airline career, things that people asked me to do, and I, I can't believe they asked somebody who was in his 20s to do that. Yeah, and I don't know if you had that thought about yourself at that time. Now you look back over that 35 year span of this amazing creation. I mean, how exactly do you look at it? I mean, do, do, you, do you look at it in all of it? I never imagined we'd come this far. Or do you just accept, well, this is a continuum of life that you've experienced in, in uh, developing this business? Well, I, I think, again, it's the right place at the right time, being able to recognize the opportunity and take it and really go for it. Um, we, we, uh, when I look back at the, the way we saw things in 1985, yeah, quite, quite a bit different, John. You and I know that the tools of the trade, you know, 747s or DC-10s, mm -hmm. DC -10s. or whatever, couldn't really fly to London without a problem from here, without payload penalties, to where we are now. So. Basically, we saw the opportunity. We saw that particularly in 1995 when the, globe, the world started to globalize and uh, we, we, you know, the, 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 the internet basically transformed our lives and everything else. So we just moved the business because we knew the business, the demand, would move with us. If we put the capacity in place, don't forget, this wasn't done on the basis of 
city pair numbers because the city pairs we were co connecting were infinitesimally small mm -hmm. in terms of the statistics that would justify putting something on. So we took a punt and we realized that if we had the right product and we did the right thing uh, in terms of, as I said, price points, knowing that people would want to travel given that the internet was transforming our lives, the online world was transforming our, our lives, the digital world, we were able to harness that and then make those fairly brave moves when it came to ordering aircraft. So when we stepped up and said we're gonna buy 100 aircraft or 50 380s or whatever, whatever we did in the old days, the world sort of stood back and said, this can't be. But the fact of the matter is it was done on the basis of a set of numbers which were being extrapolated on the basis of what we believed would happen. It was a punt because this, the figures at the time, as I said, didn't support it. Most of the time, the figures were marked anyway. You never saw how flows were, but we honestly believe that we, if we could connect China to Africa in the mid nineties, we would see a revolution in terms of people in seats and what happens. That is exactly what happened. And the more we did, the more they came. And then of course we had the uh, other airlines seeing that opportunity and emulating what we did. Um, but that's how it was. We, the more we did, the more we were successful. I'm not blowing our trumpets. It's just that the, the business model was so eminently scalable from its early inception, which is sitting in my drawer down here, by the way, to what it is today. It was just scalability, no dilution. In other words, no M&As, no alliances, entry into alliances, a total and complete focus on the job that had to be done to the exclusion almost mercilessly of everything else and uh, and that's what we did um, and okay uh, has been successful and uh, I think as I said going back to my point earlier after we get through this little uh, bit of difficulty it'll pick up again Oh, Tim, it's an amazing story, and your own personal story is, is equally uh, uh, incredible. Uh, just a couple of uh, final questions for you. Uh, with that in mind, what what do you tell young people? You must be approached by many young people. Uh, I, I know I get my share of LinkedIn messages and emails myself. Young people who want to get into this industry today or thought they were starting out and uh, it all looks like it's been blown right now with this crisis. Uh, what do you tell them about the future? I mean, the one thing I'm mentioning myself when I speak to people currently is look at this as one amazing case study, but it's not an academic case study, it's for real. Batten down your hatches, keep your, your enthusiasm and resilience, and you will be the voices of the future. What kind of uh, advice are you offering to young people uh, who, who would also love to have a career in this industry? Well, that's it. The most important thing is you want to have a career in the industry. You want, you're passionate about that. That'll sustain you through all sorts of difficulties. Um, I've had my own personal difficulties in my, you know, post uh, graduation days, etc. But I would personally singly focus. This was the industry I was going to be in. And to be quite honest, I was so keen to get in, I would take any job. I didn't mm -hmm. wait for a senior manager job or a chief economist job. I went in at the very bottom and I loved every bit of it. And I, because that, that's what I want to do. So if you're passionate about what, what it is, you've just got to bide your time. Don't throw it away because there isn't a job for you at the moment, because that's possibly going to be the case in the next uh, six, nine months or a year. But eventually it will come back. And those who are passionate about what they want to do, whether it be in airlines or anything, this is 50% of it. If you really want to be in a particular business or do something, whether it's in business or anything else, and you are driven to do that, then that'll carry you through everything, okay? It's a great business to be in, the airline industry, you and I know that. Um, we started, and for me personally, to be in the old, rather antiquated uh, pre-automation processes that we all did in at Gatwick Airport in 1972, uh, to where we are today, and having watched that, I, I sit back and I'm content that what I did with regard to following my passion then was the right thing to have done. And what I would I, would, if I'd gone somewhere else, I would have regretted for the rest of my life that I had gone into something else that I wasn't so passionate about. So if you're lucky and you have that passion, keep at it. 
read and learn, constantly monitor what is going on in the business. So you are always up to speed with whatever is, how this business is changing out. Watch things like you and I talking, see and read how other airlines are dealing with difficulties, etc. But keep with it and your passion will keep you there. Do something else in the meantime. There's lots of jobs out there. Go yeah, as you said, I think you can take any pick job. Apples. Go and pick apples. Or uh, I used to pull hot vines down to get to <laughs> anything. And it was fine. It was great fun because you know, the notion that you sit there and say, no, I'm not going to do that. That's, that's nonsense. Take what you can, get the income that you need, bide your time, keep yourself up to speed with everything else, follow your passion, and bingo, it'll come to you. Well, I think it's excellent advice. I would absolutely uh, echo all of that, Tim. And uh, you're not about to walk out the door anytime soon. You were telling us the other day you're going to stick around and uh, help navigate the, 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 the team and the, the, the ship, so to speak, through this uh, crisis. But what what do you see as next? I mean, you don't seem to me like the kind of guy who is just going to go and put your feet up. I, I know you'd like some time back in your country of birth, and I know you have a, a home in Ireland, but uh, any any plans to uh, ignore the airline industry? I can't imagine it. No, I will, I will not um, uh, disengage completely. Uh, I've always said that to the, uh, to the ownership here that I will be around for them whenever they want me to, to be there. Clearly, this is a difficult time, so I'm obviously having quite a, uh, an input to what is going on. But at the same time, as I keep saying, the guys I've worked with for quite a long time now, both expatriate and nationals, have worked with me, so they know. And we are, even this morning, having really uh, uh, heated debates about the future because none of us really know and how we need to execute that. The important thing for me is that these guys have been asking the right questions for quite a long time. And whether or not I agree with the answers or whatever, it's neither here nor there. I know that they are doing the right thing. So if I was to step back and they were out there without me parachuting in every 10 minutes saying do this, do that, that's no way. So I'm quite, I'm quite looking forward to helping the, the government here um, with my hands off the, uh, the buttons and the levers and letting the management team get on with it without the, uh, the old boy coming in and <laughs> messing things up. You can't do that. Uh, I always said I would never do that. So, so that was due at the end of this month, actually. That's when I was going to step down. In fact, it was maybe November, then April, then June. Um, so I will, I will see how that goes over the next month or two. If, if the ownership are happy with the way business is running, given the extremely difficult circumstances, and if they want to talk to me, I'm here anyway, because I, I have a home here in Dubai. Um, uh, they can get me any time. I can you know, come back and, and uh, sit and, and offer my opinions, which they may or may not want, but there we are, I'm, I'm there. I think they feel fairly comfortable about that arrangement as against me just saying, sayonara, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving for good, which I wouldn't do anyway. Um, as far as the, the rest of the business is concerned, I think my, my own, my own um, concerns about what happens in the remaining sort of years of my life and things that I need to do personally, um, which have been on hold for 35 years, because this has been, you know, a labour of love. It's been hard work. It's been totally engaging. And but there have been some casualties. Um, so I want to attend to those later. So that's probably why I will draw the line roughly about when I said I would, give or take a month or two, and um, take it a bit easier. Let them get on with it. They'll be fine. I think somebody said to me, I, I don't know if this is a reality, but you and uh, Willie Walsh is also due to step down from IAG. A, a great idea, I think, Tim, if it's true. You, you and he could uh, set up some kind of an aviation pub, maybe in Ireland appropriately. <laughs> and, and that would be an yes. incredible demand for <laughs> aviation tourism. Yes. Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't know what Willie's plans are, but I don't know he's staying on a bit. But after that, no, I think he's minded to uh, uh, leave. Um, yeah. Anything could happen. Uh, so even if it wasn't the two of you, an aviation pub of your own, the Emirates Arms in uh, East Cork yes. sounds a good idea. Or, or, or we'll just take over the bagpies at Heathrow and, uh, and uh, uh, convert that into, uh, yeah, I'll have to think about that. I'd use his. 
Tim, but we're going to have to uh, call it a day for this this discussion. I, I always enjoy speaking to you. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, I wish you a good next few months in terms of getting this uh, crisis put behind us. Uh, I hope we have some more chances to speak uh, professionally and personally uh, yeah. in the years ahead. Uh, so, so Tim Clark, President of Emirates, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I think you will enjoy listening to what we just talked about as much as I enjoyed asking Tim the questions. And uh, uh, that's it over and out from this year's uh, virtual ATM. Thanks, John.